Welcome to the eighth episode of the fourth series of the Women in CX podcast, a series dedicated to real talk conversations between women in customer experience. Listen in as we share our career stories, relive the moments that shaped us, and voice our opinions as loudly as we like about all manner of CX subjects. I'll be your host, Claire Musket, and in today's episode, I'll be talking to one of our community founding members, a seriously fabulous woman in CX leadership from the UK. Let me introduce you to today's inspiring guest. She started her career on the front lines of customer service and worked her way up the ranks in operations, leading contact centres in logistics and the housing sector for a number of years, specialising in business improvement and transformation, before moving to Yale, where she is now the head of customer experience and currently holds the title of UK CX Leader of the Year. Please welcome to the show, CX sister, Gemma Colby. Hi Gemma. Hi Claire. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Well, welcome to the Women in CX podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> and welcome to everybody listening along at home as well. So Gemma, we're going to jump right in there and I'm going to ask you the question that I ask all of our lovely guests. And that is, how exactly did you find your way into CX and where you are today? So it's one of those things that when only when I look back do I realize that I was just predestined to be here. It was it's really interesting when you when I piece back parts of my career. And when I was thinking about it, I went all the way back to um, how I found myself in my first job, having left school, because in school I was right in the middle. I was not at the top of the class and not at the bottom. So nobody really cared what I wanted to do after school. So I left school and I thought, I don't, I don't know what's next. And so I found myself in a job and that first job, I, I knew I loved talking to people. I knew I loved that. And I knew I loved helping people. And so the first job I got was um, being a receptionist. And within, it was for a very small freight company in Cape Town. I grew up in South Africa. And within, I would say a couple of months of being there without even really thinking about it, I was changing things. I was making things better. I'd started recognizing customers telephone numbers and greeting them by name and doing things that made them feel really special and the interesting part was my boss said to me oh we're going to start up a customer services team do you want to come and be part of it we think you'd be great with the customers and I was like no I don't think that's my thing don't think that so I said no so I wasn't going to do it and then through companies being sold and changing and you know the I got moved to a company that bought the company I worked for and they put me into customer services. I had no say in the matter. And it turned out I was really good at it and I really liked it. Um, I didn't like the company, so I moved. But And then I moved to a company where I was for eight years, also um, logistics. And in that time, I, with them, I grew. So they were a really small company, but I got to see some of the best things around leadership from the people who ran the company, which was, you know, rolling your sleeves up and getting in there and loading trucks and taking parcels out to customers. If, you know, if we were really close to a deadline and it was super important. Um, so, you know, seeing that firsthand and then growing with the company to the point that I set up their customer services department in Cape Town. And then after about two or three years of doing that, they said that they wanted to centralize um, all of the customer services provision into a national call center based in Johannesburg. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. <laughs> I thought, what? I don't know anything about that. But what I did know was their customers. Mm. And as smart business leaders, they knew how important that was. And so I moved up to Johannesburg and spent 18 months setting up their call center and recruiting and setting up all of those processes. and and learned so much. I look, look back on that time when I was, I think it was 25 mm. and just doing it, I thought, I took everything I knew about what our customers needed and, and with the challenges of going from a very mm. central close knit to a, a national operation, which, was, um, which came with its challenges, but it was a really rewarding time. And then I moved to the UK in 2008 so my family are originally from the UK and so I knew at some point I would come here I thought it would just be for two years um, it's been a little bit longer than that now and um, I got my first job in housing 
And whilst I worked, and this was at Southern Housing, and whilst I worked there, I got a, a role. It was a, well, it was a continuous systems improvement officer, which was a CSI officer. And so whilst the role <laughs> title wasn't the main reason I applied for the job, I mean, I quite liked it. <laughs> Um, but that job, I, and I, I say that that job changed my career because uh, it really, I, it was the first time when I interviewed that I really backed myself. Mm. I went into an interview saying, I've read everything about this job and I think I can do it, although I'm not bringing a list of evidence that says I've done it all before. I'd done pieces of it in different roles and I'd changed processes and I'd introduced new things, but I hadn't really led um, improvement and transformation project but I had a boss who was absolutely incredible and he interviewed me and he was looking for somebody who thought in a certain way and so that's how he structured the interview and so he really put me through my paces in terms of seeing how I thought and how I would approach things and as a result of that he, he gave me the job and it was incredible I spent about 18 months to two years working with him and two other colleagues in one of the best teams I've ever worked in where I learned so much and I was just a sponge for two years, just mm -hmm. absorbing everything from, you know, how to lead customer led improvement and use insight and about systems thinking and, and so many things that I've taken into the rest of my career and, um, and how to do the right thing for customers. It was, it was absolutely incredible. Um, so about two years later, I moved on to another housing association, Catalyst Housing in, in West London into a more senior business improvement consultant role. I did that for a couple of years. Again, everything, when I look at it, I think they all would have been called customer experience roles of some sort now, <laughs> yeah. um, if, if people were creating them, because that was really at the heart of it and the crux of, of the role. And, and then after doing those types of roles for about four or five years, I thought, what happens if, I, if I'd known everything I'd known that I'd learned then when I'd been running the call center, I think I would have done a very different job. And I thought, well, what happens if I take all that learning and do that now? And there was an opportunity at Catalyst to run their call center. It's a small call center um, in their Ealing office in, in West London, but it was, I did that job for three years and it was a fascinating time because taking what you know in theory and put it into practice, which is what we expect a lot of our operational managers to do mm -hmm. while running an operation, it's really challenging. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most rewarding three years I've spent. It was tough and we made a real difference to our, our residents there. Um, when I took over the team, they used to sort of congratulate themselves for taking a hundred calls a day. That would be their measure of success. And it wouldn't really be about, mm -hmm. um, what experience the customer had had. And so we went on a significant transformation in those three years to really think about that. And about two years into it, one of the um, members of our resident group, the person who led the resident group, she came in and she said to me, residents have been saying it's really different calling here. And she says, I don't know what you're doing, just keep doing it. And I thought, yes, that's exactly what you need to be hearing in terms of making a difference. So that was incredible. I did that until the end of 2015. And then thought I did miss doing the improvement project strategic work and, and thought it was time to, to move back to that. And because and I, I knew I could do both. I wasn't sure which I wanted to carry on in terms of my career doing. And I, I finished that stint knowing that it was I got so much from it, but it was, wasn't where my, my passion lay. And so then I moved to Yale, um, knowing that from the time I'd spent what it looked like to lead an operation mm. and how to really get everybody on board with it. So I felt I had a, a really good um, foundation for supporting and coaching those leaders as well as working in, in projects to really get the best outcome for both the people and the team as well as the customers. So I started at Yale, and when I worked there, I moved, my, my role there was to, again, would have been a customer experience role, no doubt, if, it had been, if, it, if we'd been in the time we are now. And the role was to look at all of our customer service journeys and make those better. So I worked really closely with the person that headed up that operation to 
be getting the right measures in place, the right listening to customers in the right way. But it was, yeah, I was in a very different place then to what it is today, which um, it, it was not as focused on the customer. So as, as we wanted, it was very much, you know, I got known as being the person who was the voice of the customer, but then I was a bit of a lone voice. Whereas now, you know, every, it's everybody, it's much wider. It's really into, integrated into our culture now, which I think has been incredible, but that's really what's, what we've done in the last three years, I would say, or two to three years. So in, so how I eventually have landed up having CX in my title was in early 2020. So just as COVID started, I got appointed into the head of customer experience position. I started on the 1st of February and moved to working from home in March. It was um, my dream job doing it in a way I just wasn't really prepared for, which was being remote and, and isolated from, from people. Um, but it meant that it was as a, the, the team got created. So I set up the customer experience team and it got created as a result of some leadership changes that happened the back end of 2019 into 2020. So the team was created um, and it was, our job is to improve the end-to-end -end customer experience through insight and driving excellent digital experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's, my team's focus is broadly the same. We're refining it and we're looking at some um, and how, how we do that better, but it's always an evolution. And then I would say the other key thing in terms of how, finding my way to CX and giving it a, a label for me was finding women in CX. So at the, the start of last year, so 2021, I was having a, a, an annual review with my boss and we had a, a really big conversation about, you know, how I needed to think about customer experience and how and where it sat in the marketplace and go and have a look and see what it looked like outside of Yale. And I stumbled across a webinar that you were on and, um, and you were talking about the um, Women in CX launching. And I thought, whatever happens, I have to be part of that. I don't even know anything more than um, and you, you, just so much of what you said resonated. And I thought, OK, let, let's go and see more about this. And then I, I registered and came along on International Women's Day. Um, and then as a result of that, became one of the Beta founding members, which I just to see the community and how it's grown. It's just been incredible. And I've got so much, so much out of it as well. It's been great. Oh, I don't know what I would have done without you. I'm um, thinking back, it's just over a year now, isn't it? That we've it all is. been together. Um, but so much of your story resonates with me. I think, you know, starting on the front line in operations. So you were as a receptionist. I actually started in hospitality. I was a waitress. Yeah. Um, but that operational grounding, the reality of what it's actually like to work on the front line, I think it's one of the most advantageous things that stood me in good stead throughout my career as were the operational management roles so you know you in contact centers yep. me in general management you know actually running the job uh, sorry running uh, the operation and and you know that similar recognition that at the time like I think the point you said was about you know teams congratulating themselves for the number of calls they took and the impact that actually things like KPIs have on what we focus on in operations and having come kind of full circle to, you know, kind of being in the support centers and customer experience and understanding why that is, I think mm -hmm. it makes us such better customer experience leaders because we've been there and we have that insight and empathy into why things are the way that they are. And um, something else that you said, you know, like not just thinking about the customer and the business in what we try to do but the consideration we have for all of the humans around us and the people Completely. on the employee side I think that for me is something that I developed through having big teams um at the front line in and in operations that um I think if I'd not had that and I'd just gone into the support center and gradually managed bigger corporate management teams well, everything's so different you know like my management experience or frontline experience we were literally running around and on our feet all day it's such a different world isn't it or like taking calls all day in, in your in your sense um but I was really interested in 
the the route that you came through with like business improvement too and hearing um something i hear a lot of women in cx talk about actually the the feeling it of like I've just arrived at CX because I now have it in my job title and then when they're surrounded by women in CX in the community and we all kind of figure out and I see the light bulb moment where everyone's like oh my god I've been doing this for years I just didn't have it in my job title <laughs> well it was the first time I wrote so you know I've been setting myself these challenges to step outside of my comfort zone so you know whether it's right you know doing an interview with CXM or whether it's doing different things one of the things I, you know, when I sat down and worked it out, I went, I, I've been doing this type of work, even in operational roles yeah. for years. I, I couldn't agree with you more about the advantages of having worked frontline and then led those teams. Mm -hmm. I learned so much about how to lead change um, in that contact center. At, yes, it was a small contact center and you know I but it came with so many learnings about how you needed to bring people on the journey with you mm -hmm. and how much they have the the ability to really day-to-day -day impact your customer experience and often we forget how important it is to make those people realize how important they are Yes. And so listening to them, and it's one of the things that yell for us now in the last few years, we've really created very authentic mm. forums to talk and hear from. And mm. it's not unknown that my boss will pick up, or any of us really, but mm. you know, particularly my boss will pick up the phone and talk to one of our frontline consultants and really hear what's going on. And I, so that is, you know, when I ran a call center, I was three rows of desks away to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not quite as, as easy to do, but um, whether that's through doing cross-functional call listening sessions now or messaging transcript reviews, where you go into the session really genuinely having it be about the experience and not about who, it's uncomfortable when your team's being reviewed, but if you create the right culture and the right mm -hmm feeling in that meeting it's about mm. genuine improvement and, and everybody knows what needs to change it's just giving the space to talk about it mm, yeah I absolutely love that um I I remember like going into bigger and bigger corporates in the support center management team kind of getting up to the senior level and realizing like how differently people who hadn't had operational experience saw employees at the front line and quite yeah. often talked about them as like a resource or an expense or um you know like something somewhere along a set of recommendations and it would just be like staff need to be such and such but um but that not really having any meaning to them um or saying we need to roll out some kind of change program but there was nothing about how we were going to invest in employee engagement around this change yep. and to me it was just second nature but actually realizing for a lot of people it isn't that um they've yeah. got a lot in common here Gemma yeah I think about it daily it's definitely part of mm. how I shaped how I think as a leader love it love it um so obviously incredible career what was one particular challenge you've had to overcome to become the woman you are today? So I would say the one that comes to mind for us, for me to share is one that I would say overcoming. I think I've made significant strides and I'm very proud of, of this. So to even be able to talk about it and recognize it is in it quite simply is belief in myself. Um, so often in the past, my starting point has been to believe that everyone around me is more experienced and more knowledgeable than I am, and that it's only a matter of time before they realize I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I can joke about it now, but that's that's a real thing. Um, and Women in CX has been a quite a, I, I remember a point, it was one of our very first sessions that we did was around imposter syndrome. And I remember looking at it and I'd, I'd heard about it and I'd read about it and stuff resonated and we just had this session and, and there was something shared on social media afterwards and I shared it across my network and I just thought, let's talk about this. Mm. I, I, I'm learning different ways of positioning and I know there's been some great articles shared recently about it that is slightly shifting my thinking around how much of it it's about the world around us that mm. makes us feel that way and how much of it is ourselves. And I think mm. that's a very interesting conversation starter and I'm starting to have that with my teams 
But I think that starting point being somebody's better than me at this um, can be a real shadow and a bit of a burden to carry because it's you, you're setting yourself a number of hurdles to get through before you actually get to show what you can do. Um, so I have been working on that quite a lot over the last year. And I think some of the things I've done to, to make the progress that I have is, you know, coach and be coached, mentor and be mentored. Those things are incredibly powerful. And I think doing stuff outside of my comfort zone and realizing that when I did them, there's always learning, but that's great. But it's not, it's not terrible and it's not a disaster. And okay, good. All right, let's keep going. And I think having that sort of growth mindset as well makes a big difference in terms of moving through it. 100% agree. And uh, this is something that, again, really resonates with me. And I'm sure it does with a lot of women out there too. But um, with the conversations that I have on such a regular basis, like in one-to-one conversations when I'm onboarding um, women into the community, it seems to be something that everybody feels, particularly women, but we don't talk about, or it feels like there's something wrong with us. The fact that we don't have the self-belief that we should have. Mm -hmm. And to pick up on a a, a couple of points that you said there, like, um, I think I'm always continuously surprised when women meet me and they think, because of what I've achieved and what I do that somehow I've got all the answers and I'm like this supremely confident being and then when I say you know actually before I go on stage and speak I'm actually thinking I'm going to be sick because I'm so nervous and that you know starting a business has been the most petrifying thing I've ever done because I constantly feel like I don't know what I'm doing and that I shouldn't be here and I shouldn't be you know Um, but when you listen to the words it's like that what I should be doing like or like so or believing that something out there is uh, has all the answers and we don't but gradually learning that actually when I do tune in to myself my own thoughts my intuition it's actually the best decisions I make and I feel most comfortable about them it's when I'm distracted by the shoulds and coulds and what other people tell me or or, or society's pressuring me to be like as a, as a female leader or, or role model but that's when I start to panic and think I'm not doing things right um so the one thing that you said you know there's the the thread that was going on in our community that Claire Fry posted yes. about questioning you know is imposter syndrome even a thing because yep. um we're constantly told we have imposter syndrome because um it's something that women particularly experience yet actually when you look at it it's the situations that we're frequently in where we are different to people so so for example like a male dominated environment or a meeting full of men or um I know we're really changing the status quo here but I used to have it all the time like I'd be asked to speak at an event and be sitting on a panel and I'd just be surrounded by like middle-aged white guys and there's me you know with my heels on my long red hair the only woman and and I would literally feel like oh well everybody you know around me they they're the authorities they know more than me like I felt different but actually maybe it wasn't me it was the fact that (laughs) that that difference was engendered so what are your thoughts on that you said you're thinking and moved on where have you got it has so where have I got to on it is that I when I read that article and I've shared it a couple of times I'm trying you know having conversations about this with my team as well because you know, when we've spoken about it, some of this stuff has resonated with them. One mm-hmm. of my one of my best friends, as soon as I read that article, I thought this she is so successful and one of the most authentic, wonderful, emotionally intelligent leaders I've ever known. Um, I met her when I worked in housing many years ago, and I just thought about how hard she's had to fight against a lot of those you don't look what traditional su- success looks like. Mm-hmm. And Um, And she said so much of it resonated with her. And I suppose my thinking is, is that I think there's still some stuff in me, that's me, that I I need to be mindful of and think about. But one of the things I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about over the last year or so is that if you're measuring yourself against a traditional version of success, so growing up for me, it was a middle-aged man that, you know, you had the 
seen your role and you knew all the answers and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And anybody that challenged that only challenged it successfully if you became more like that person. Got you, yeah. Think of like power suits and, you know, so I grew up in, in South Africa where traditional African wear was bright and colorful, but you saw people being successful because they suddenly were adopting a suit mm. rather than coming in as their true self. Mm. So I think um, the imposter syndrome that we've been labeling a lot in this, you know, in this period is, mm. is actually because we haven't been calling out that what we're really trying to challenge and be uncomfortable because that's the nature of transformation mm. um, is that success doesn't look like we've always thought it looks and we have to redefine it. Yeah. And, and spe specifically, a white middle-aged man, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't look like that yet. In some um, cases, it may do. And in other cases, yeah. it needs to look different. And that needs to all be OK, rather than being a one size fits yeah. all. Well, I just I thought it was fascinating that the, the, if the kind of deeper layer or level to that is the systemic stuff, isn't it? So, yes. for example, patriarchy or white supremacism and... Um, as an intersectional feminist community, you know, was appreciating and understanding that it's only really our gender that might be a barrier, whereas women that are from different races or sexual yeah. orientations or um, different abilities like neurodivergence or otherwise, or even age, you know, like it gets harder and harder and harder the further away you are from the traditional exactly. mold of what someone's supposed to look like. Um, and I I shared in the community and for listeners I'll put a link to the post that I found on Instagram. Um, but I think like this the notion of like white feminism has really come up for me recently as well. Like this boss babe thing that yeah. I think I like would use the hashtag boss babe in the past and I'd never thought anything of it and not realize just kind of how damaging that um, that that notion of what a successful woman. <laughs> yeah is supposed to look like and be like and um yeah. you know like the kind of glamorization of like female leadership over actually our ability to lead and our capability and our core competencies yeah. like um um yeah like I just find it fascinating and the more I'm learning about it the more I'm diving into it the more I'm questioning like my my ethos around around stuff as well yeah. and the, the only other thing that comes to mind for me really of one of the many other things that I've just mentioned is it is also that like my own battle with perfectionism you yeah. know you say like there's some things about yourself that need to change it's not just society I really realize that that is the thing that holds me back because right. I hold myself to a ridiculous standard and um, sometimes like moments of indecision or like fear of making a leap or doing something or getting out of the comfort zone or taking a chance is because I'm so petrified of not doing it perfectly yeah. and what will what will become of me if I don't um, but living in a startup world for the last pretty much 18 months has kind of trained me out of that because there is no such thing as perfect when you're bootstrapping your way to um, create something sustainable for the long term without like taking investment and stuff um but it's been the experience of, like you said, you know, trying something and finding out it wasn't that bad or it didn't go so yeah. terribly. That it's been the same for me. Like having to let go of the perfectionism and just do things in a really agile, bootstrappy way has shown me actually you can still get the job done really well. Yeah. And actually, sometimes the results are even better when you don't do perfect. But yeah. I think you're right. It's having that growth mindset and um, taking on challenges that teach you about yourself that actually you do have the skills and capability within you. But Gemma, I, I have it, to point out that you said yeah. when in your introduction part around like, your career journey, you were the woman, you were the girl actually at the time, she was, you were much younger, who went for a job <laughs> with no experience and said, I know I can do this job. I'm the person that can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so she, she's in there and she's been there the whole time. <laughs> very interesting point. Yeah, there's definitely something that I think does, does drive me to like it's it's not that it's never good enough so for me I, I think perfection is one of the things that does get in the way because I think perfection is one of the things that stalls progress um mm -hmm. I think you can land up standing still rather than moving forward when you're trying for things to be perfect so I think um if you've got a mindset of iteration you'll you'll, you'll be amazed where you where you land up and you're right that sort of 
I do have that. My brain is going, right, okay, how can it be different? How can we do, even when I was, you know, answering the phone and answering a customer by name, so they felt special, you know, that was something that nobody told me to do. It was just a very natural, oh, I can make this a bit better. You know, we've, at, at Yale, we've been talking about marginal gains recently mm, and like that. how, yeah, that sort of just keep, keep going. Effect. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, that, I, and I think the other part I would say in terms of, yes, you're absolutely right. There was something in me that made me walk into an interview and say, I'm going to really front up here that I think I'm the right person for this job. And I, we'll talk about that. And obviously I was not quite that confident when I did it, but my, my boss did say the thing that sold him on it, which is, I think probably comes down to my curiosity, which is, I think one of my superpowers is I sat there and at the end of the interview, when also do you have any questions? And I literally just pulled out a folder and then he said, I basically interviewed them back um, around the job and what they wanted out of it and all of these things. And he just said that was, he, he was, he was sold already, but that was the moment that really sealed the deal for him. Mm, yeah I, I I do fundamentally believe that we are all born with innate confidence and it's just what chips away at us over time but you should definitely know. take comfort and if you know I, I've, the growth I've seen in you personally even in the just the last year has been incredible but I think you should always just remind yourself like of the Gemma who went into that job interview and did that because that's who you are <laughs> yes I'm gonna own that yes absolutely. um so you know the last year has been amazing for you in terms of seeing you win CX Leader of the Year. Yale's yeah. won loads of awards. Um, there's been so many accolades. Um, I, I guess kind of just cut into the chase, really. What do you think it takes to become a great CX Leader in today's increasingly complex environments? Tell us about your, your perspective on that. So I think the things that come to mind in terms of what's what's really helped us in in that so I think definitely from an award perspective what Yale has done is the senior leadership have really made it very clear that how important customer is and we're making all of those changes driven by what does work and make a difference for our customers and then my role is to make that work from a customer experience and lead that conversation and you know I think for me it's about being really clear on the the, the business objective and the the strategic direction yes, of the business. Absolutely. I think a CX leader's role is to see if this is a word, the interconnectedness of your organization and how. So I very often it's I can't remember who said it. It, it would have been at one of the, the women in CX webinars that just seeing how all those things fit together is often something a CX leader does but doesn't recognize. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's quite important to recognize because then you you are able to use it to then further reinforce great stakeholder relationships. Mm -hmm. I think I, that's definitely something I took from that operational leadership time, whether that's right at the front line or whether it's with your other peers, whatever that looks like, because if you have those great relationships, you see how it all fits together and you tell the story, yeah. then you bring in the customer to that. It's quite a powerful combination. Um, and I think ultimately, and this is for any leader, but I would say in particular uh, for me, it's been something that I often am given feedback on is my growth mindset. Um, I, I realize that, you know, my job is to not necessarily know the answers, but to ask the questions and my curiosity and surrounding myself with different opinions, coaching, mentoring, all of that good stuff. I think all of that just ladders up to, to always wanting to be better and, and see how things can improve. So I think if you do that with your company's direction in mind and what your customers need and how the business works together with people, um, I think that can be quite powerful. Mm, yeah, so just scribbling down like some of the things that you'd, you'd mentioned there. Um, so yeah, I think kind of that commercial awareness that customer experience really only is a means to a business end. And I, I think what we see quite a lot of the time is customer experience for customer experience sake and people getting really frustrated with why is nobody listening to me or why you know aren't they letting me do this big project that's going to cost us a fortune but they haven't kind of laddered it back to well, what is the organizational goal and objective that me doing what I do can help to fulfill and positioning it in that way um I, I, you mentioned like systems thinking essentially that's what it is isn't it <laughs> yes. like um, and 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 naturally being systems thinkers even though we might not recognize it 
um, seeing how like all the pieces of the puzzle fit together, yeah. how organizational um, structures show a path of who we need to influence and how, but doing that very intuitively rather than necessarily having to think about it. And then when someone says, oh, that's like, that's a real skill, skill it's a system, systems level thinking, isn't it? And we're like, ooh, <laughs> it is. Um, but storytelling, I think it's another thing that you called out there, you know, being able to take data and um, it customer insight or feedback and be able to show why it is so important that we put customers um, more centrally in the conversations that we're having or being able to see it from that perspective. And I absolutely agree with you, um, having a growth mindset, because I think there were a few years in my career, I thought I knew it all. And I wasn't massively successful at customer experience when I took that approach. <laughs> <laughs> but when I started to be like, it's just so open to learning and learning from other people, learning from different divisions and departments and trying to understand as much as I could about finance and marketing and digital and kind of bringing that all back in and then going again with yeah. how customer experience could help achieve a business objective. I was my most successful and absolutely coaching is one of the best investments I ever made in my okay. own development. I didn't, I didn't have enough of that when I was on the business side. I don't think I ever got a coaching session. I, I was fortunate on a few occasions to have a, um, a line manager that had coaching skills, but right. never did any formal coaching. Um, and I, what I see as mentoring now in comparison to what I had when I was on the business side is completely different, isn't it? Yeah. You get assigned somebody in a more senior role and they're supposed to like lead and guide you. But when it's within an organizational framework, it's still very much the agenda is about that organization and not about you as an individual. So um, for, I would for, say for me. External I've, mentoring is quite a challenge. Yeah. So I was going to say, I've had a, a, my mentoring within Yale particularly has been different. Uh, they, of, there's an element of, yeah. of it being about Yale, but actually it's very much been around me. Um, that, that's has, great. It was just my, my experience. Yeah, wasn't your experience that? was slightly, <laughs> yes, exactly, slightly different. Um, yeah. yeah. Which is, which has been really good. But maybe that's like part of, you know, so this transfer, transformational journey that, the organization and the leadership's been on has resulted in the outcomes for things like coaching and mentoring within your organization being so different yeah. because uh, um, it is you know not just saying that we're being more human-centered or more customer-centered or more people-centered on the last couple of years you've been through a journey where you're actually doing it and taking yeah. those actions I think it does change the, the frame of reference for that yeah. so that, well, that was all awesome but we went out of time Sadly, Gosh, I could chat really to, quickly. <laughs> I know I could talk to you all day. I really could. Um, so yeah, the, the final question is like, what piece of advice would you give to our listeners out there? What would you say to other women in CX? I think I would say it comes back to something you you said, which is learning to trust you. And I think the biggest advice I would give and, and what I'm really focused on is about understanding me mm. and um, what inspires me or energizes me and what drains me and working out how I, you know, eat, spit, do less that drains me, but all book it, bookend it with stuff that energizes me. So it's taking quite a strategic approach to how you keep your resilience and your energy and how you keep growing as a person but it's 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 me focused in order to be that leader um for others as well i absolutely love that and it just fell into place for me in that last couple of sentences that you said if we don't trust ourselves how can we ever believe in ourselves yeah so for whatever we want to achieve in our lives as individuals or leaders it has to start with me and believing believing in myself will come as a result of investing in myself, trusting myself. And yeah, yeah, I love that, Gemma. Oh, what a nice note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for being here today, for being the most amazing founding member of the Women in Six oh, community. Thank you. Thanks for having and, me. And just everything um, that you've done for, for me and the rest of the community over the last year. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. And oh, having you thank you. 
<laughs> and thank you to everybody who listened along as well at home. So that's it, everybody. We'll see you all next time. Bye for now. Bye, Gemma. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Women in CX podcast with me, Claire Musket. If you enjoyed the show, please drop us a like, subscribe and leave a review on whichever platform you're listening or watching on. And if you want to know more about joining the world's first online community for women in customer experience, please check out womenincx.community and follow the Women in CX page on LinkedIn. Join us again next time where I'll be talking to another amazing community member about challenging gender bias for the future generation of women leaders. See you all then.